Um, I guess my name is Yatsu. I'm chairman and co-founder of Animoco Brands. And today I'm going to talk about why digital property rights matters, since uh, I propose for the theme. So first off, what you will have noticed in the last uh, six months in particular, even though it's supposed to be a bear market, Web3 uh, uh, sort of blockchain investing has actually been on a tear. Even if you look at just the month of August, in what's supposed to be a crypto winter, the majority of investments have gone into NFT and Web3 gaming. And that's actually an interesting trend. I want to talk a little bit about why that's so important later on and why digital property rights matter so much, because many people in the space are, have become real believers as opposed to four years ago. And this is basically the statistics. You can see that the amount of funding and uh, support that's flown in just this year has been close to $7 billion already, of which the uh, majority of that has actually gone into NFT and gaming, which is basically the red part. Close to a billion dollars just in the month of August. So now why does this really matter? Because what we're seeing here right now at the heart is the fight of what basically the metaverse should be. The conversation often is around maybe Facebook, or maybe Microsoft basically taking big bets on the metaverse, spending tens of billions of dollars to try to own this next iteration of the internet. And why is this so important? Well, first of all, and this is interesting also from an Asian perspective, matters particularly because we're here in Asia, we have basically the majority of the world uh, online here in this part of the world. Uh, but interestingly enough, penetration rates actually isn't yet at, uh, at uh, close to 90%. It's more like 60 or 70%. So there's still growth happening. Right? So Asia leads the world by internet users. The majority of people in the US are spent all of their time online, as you know. Um, the average person uh, in this part of the world actually spends somewhere between 9 to 10 hours a day online. Now, you may not actually want to admit that, but if you consider the amount of time that you're actually spending on Instagram, on Facebook, and all these platforms, the reality is that you've all become digital dependents in one form or the other. In other words, you're already in kind of a pre-metaverse. You may not think of it that way because you think of it as an add-on to your life, but actually, perhaps, it is your life. And I think this is the important distinction because who owns that? And of course, with close to now 3.4 billion gamers and 5 billion people online, the majority of the world is online, and the majority of the online world is already experiencing a kind of metaversal type experience. And what this is about is a fight for our time and attention, as all of you here know, right? And in the past, this was in terms of media, in terms of television, was another form of trying to sort of have our time or attention. But this time and attention is a little bit different because the resource is us. We are that resource. And it comes down to this. The world's most valuable resource today is data, has really been for the last 10, 15 years. And unlike this resource, which comes from the ground, this resource comes from our time and our attention. Now, the thing is that this resource gets harvested by the largest of platforms today. For those of you who remember the days of Web 1, we generated all this data in sort of the early forms of the internet, but we couldn't make value out of it. The parallel we think of it is a little bit like oil. If you discovered oil 500 years ago, it would have been nice, but you can't do anything because you lack the machinery to refine it to something valuable. And that's the same with data. Until deep learning and AI came to bear, we weren't able to make sense of all the data that's out there. Now, all that data we're generating to the tunes of billions of users a second, right at this minute, they are blocks of information, and they create a network effect, and they create knowledge in a manner that is superior to any kind of network effect that we can build just from our own human capacity. So this knowledge translates into value into platforms, and they know more about us than we know about ourselves. So we think of this as a kind of digital colonialism because we don't think that what we're doing on Facebook right now is entertaining. We think our time on Facebook is that we're working for Facebook. We're working for Instagram. In fact, we're working for every game that we're playing because you're not spending one or two hours a day on this one. You're spending eight to 10 hours, in fact, on an average, which means some of us spend more time on this one, which is more than we spend at work. And this data is the work we create, and the value that we give to the platform is what makes them powerful. And that's one of the reasons why data companies, Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, whatever you want to name it, are the most powerful companies in the world today. So this is what the world actually looks like. We exist in a kind of digital feudalism. You know, whether it's the house of Google, the house of Apple, the kingdom of Facebook, this is the world we are in right now. Now think of it slightly differently. What happens to any one of your businesses here if these platforms, not based on some kind of judiciary or not just based on kind of legal framework, deplatform you? 
just because they want to. This was our own story, in fact. We had apps on the App Store. They removed us for reasons they never properly explained to us, just because they didn't seem to like what we were doing. That Instagram handle you think you own on Facebook, that you've built and cultivated with your 10 million followers, that's not yours, right? That YouTube following that you have, who can remove it? Who decides that fate? You don't decide it, they do. And every time you're bringing users to the platform, you make them valuable. This is the world we live in today. And this will also contribute to the wealth inequality. It's already beginning for those that have and have nots, for those who have access to the data or know how to get value from that data and will continue to rise this way, we believe. That's why Web3, and particular non-fungible tokens, as a framework for digital property rights, is, we think, the answer. Because with the beginning of blockchain, data now becomes a public good. In the past, data was something that was private. It, sit inside, it sat inside Facebook, it sat inside Google. They controlled it, they harvested a network. And we would never know what that value is. One of the most powerful things about blockchain is that you're able to now analyze publicly, like a free market, what your time is worth. Imagine if you're using Facebook, and at the end of the day, you have a little counter that says, your time on Facebook was worth $50, because that's how much Facebook made from you. Your relationship with Facebook will change. You will ask, oh, well, if I'm making you $50, shouldn't I receive at least 20 or 30% of that, for instance? But we don't know what that is. We just know the outcome, that they make $120 billion last year. We just don't know how they make it, because they don't want us to know. With blockchain, all this is open. And much of what happens here is all the content, all of you as content creators, therefore create assets. Because now it's an asset in blockchain, which then becomes a platform. Let me explain. All of our history of innovation and growth has come from this paradigm of property rights and ownership. The fact that we can own something is the reason that we can innovate on top in a permissionless manner. The ownership of a car is not the innovation per se. It has helped us move from one place to another 130 years ago with the invention of the horseless carriage. But really what happened is because we have decentralized, permissionless ownership of cars is a reason that the automobile industry employs you know, millions of people outside of the manufacturing of cars. It's why you can have Grab and Uber and Lyft, car wash companies, people who make tires, all the innovation, all the jobs, all the economic activity that happens around the ownership of cars. None of them have to talk to Tesla or Volkswagen or Mercedes for permission to build on their cars. In the Web2 world, it's like, oh, I'd like to hire a driver, 30%, please, right? And maybe I don't like this driver. Or I want to build an Uber service. Well, you know, I want to tax that. I mean, even at this moment in time, a company like Epic, producers of Fortnite, cannot launch their app on the App Store as an example. That's the difference here. And so innovation mushrooms because of the fact that you have permissionless growth. I can build something, and my only customers I need to work with are the ones who have ownership of these assets because they're truly mine. Every country that doesn't have true ownership actually economically doesn't do as well. Assets themselves also are social identifiers. When you think of our history today, everything when I buy, do I actually buy it because of its utility? If that were true, all our shoes should be black, and they should only be one function because none of the shoes that you buy from Puma, Adidas, ASIC, or any brand that you love makes you run faster. Maybe for some of us, but most of us, it doesn't make any difference. We choose it because it says something about ourselves. The Birkin bag here used to be, the floor bag used to be as valuable as a board ape. Board ape is much more valuable today. But the point being that what are you buying when you're buying a Birkin bag? Or what are you buying when you're buying a Rolex? How much of that is the material value versus actually the fact that there is virtual value? It's network effect. How famous is it? What do people think about it? What do your friends think about it? Every purchase you make in your own physical world, how much of it is determined by its utility versus by what you think says something about who you are? And by status, we don't necessarily mean conspicuous consumption like status, like let me show you how wealthy I am, just what it says to you, right? For instance, I wear athletic wear because I want to pretend I'm athletic, for instance, right? Um, that doesn't mean it's expensive. It's just a signal that you want to put out. And because it's blockchain, all the assets that you're producing, just like in the real world, becomes interoperable. Just like the car, it's a platform. The person who invented the baby seat 30 years after the creation of the car didn't actually have an API for the car to fit in his baby seat. He just adjusted the baby seat to fit to the car as it is. And that's what we see now with Web3 and with digital assets. You can adjust and adopt 
the assets any which way you like. You can take a board ape and integrate it into your game, into your environment, any which way you like. You don't need to talk to Yugo Labs for permission how to use the board apes. You can do that yourself. You can do that with Sandbox Land. You can do that with any asset now because now you have peer-to-peer -peer ownership economics as you have in the real world. And with that, you have freedom. And this is the key because digital property rights is the key for digital freedom. So what is the reason why these assets become so valuable? And this is one of the other areas, is that when you have economic freedom, when you have digital property rights, you can have natural capital formation. The reason that you can all get a mortgage from a bank is because there is an ability for the bank to value your asset, to say this property in Singapore, Singapore government's gonna be around hopefully for a long time, we believe. Therefore, when you buy the property and they guarantee this property right, you can get a 10 or 20 or 30 year mortgage. In fact, the safety of the sanctity of the government lasting your life is probably larger than that. Therefore, I'm happy to give you maybe even a 50-year mortgage. This is not possible in Web2. I can't take a gaming asset and have any kind of capital formation because it doesn't belong to the player. It belongs to the platform. And is a platform going to guarantee it? Not likely. So that's one of the reasons why virtual land and any of these assets have had the ability to form this kind of capital as we have seen in the real world because I am now able to value this. And through the open data framework, I can also see and analyze what's it worth, who's buying it, is it true, is it not? Just like a free and fair and open market. Now, the market may have run, well, run ahead of itself in 2021, but the foundation of property rights still is maintained, which is that you can do the things that you can now do in the real world. And this capital formation is now the reason why you have things like play and earn in gaming, right? why you can rent assets, why you can have lending platforms, why you can generate yield, in fact, all the financial, sort of financial benefits and value formation that you can see in the physical world is now possible in the digital world, free from the platform. The parallel in which I'm going to close on is that we think of basically the metaverse and blockchain very similar to building nation states. I'll get to that a little bit later. And right now, we're at a point where most of the world in the digital world is all in this element of low property rights. It's the reason that every one of us who's using Facebook or is on YouTube is worth, or in Spotify, is worth maybe one, two, or maybe maximum 10 or 20 cents per click. That's our life in the digital world because it's a center of rental economy. That's not actually what we're worth, but on the, the rental platforms we are because we have low property rights. What is our economic worth in places like North Korea, for instance, versus what is our economic worth in places like the US or Singapore? So every place that has strong property rights has high economic activity, and all the places that have low property rights have low economic activity, meaning that the current world that we're in in Web2, despite the trillions that are generated, are in the low property segment. So what happens when you actually introduce property rights and create a decentralization of these economies? We're gonna unlock, we believe, trillions of dollars of unlocked value that is already there as latent economic forces. And because of property rights, you can now have these things called DAOs, which is decentralized autonomous organizations. Really what you can think of them as a kind of democratic framework through a token infrastructure that would allow you basically to vote on decisions and have governance, just like you would have in sort of nation states. Decisions in which you can start making through massive and quick uh, sort of consensus building. Blockchains are the new national economies. When you look at the value of an L1, L2, or a sandbox or whatever, you don't look at it from a P&L standpoint. You don't say, what's the profit of that business? That's the traditional way of looking at companies. You look at the economic activity that is generated. How many people are building on it? How much employment is there? It's like when you look at the example of a car I gave, is the automotive industry just how much Tesla can sell? Or is the automotive industry the entire encompassing of the car industry as a whole, the employment that it generates? So that's the way that we need to look at that. And that's basically the mechanism and why we're so excited about this. Because when you're building something like a national economy, you need to also have a framework that is political. Blockchain isn't just a framework for you know, technical solutions. In fact, from a pure technical standpoint, it's kind of inferior. What it really provides is a political platform, a way in which you can have decentralized open platform frameworks. That's really the innovation. It's a socioeconomic one, which is backed by technology. So I want to close with a thought experiment here. Imagine if Facebook was built on Web3 and every person who's using through the framework of tokenization was actually a shareholder or owner in Facebook. The user who contributes value to the platform, because remember, if we all stopped using Facebook, what's the value of Facebook? It's nothing. 
But if we now suddenly have a vote in this one, what would that framework that platform look like? It probably wouldn't do the things that it's doing right now. It would probably have a different kind of stakeholder capitalism that doesn't exist in Facebook, which is very much shareholder capitalism, for instance. The end users would participate in a manner which is more beneficial for the community as a whole, and consensus will be built about what might be the right, perhaps moral or ethical framework of a business in the same way that we make decisions today about why we might choose to pay more to buy green products or more ESG-friendly products. Because we don't purchase things just purely for utility. We do care about where the world is going. But these platforms don't allow us to do that because that framework doesn't exist. That's what Web3 is trying to build. That's what we're trying to build. That's not what Facebook is trying to build, but just imagine what that world will look like in this example. And Web3 basically takes everything that is company, that is controlled, into community-owned platforms. In fact, many of you here who are servicing influencers, who are influencers yourself, your value comes from your community, in fact. And that basically is a way in which you create value back to the community. And with Web3, we can create a more open, fair, and secure internet. I'll close with this. Obviously, you know, we're not in the US, but George Washington, after all, was founding father of the US with the Constitution. And he made this point, which I think is true in the digital world as well. Freedom and property rights are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. If we don't have property rights, we don't have freedom. The same is true for digital. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for, for joining us and for that brilliant presentation. My pleasure. Um, it's, uh, you, you won't remember this, but we met in 2018. I remember. Outblaze? <laughs> Outblaze, yes. Uh, Out, what was Outblaze? We were working for Star TV. Yes, that was. We were working for Channel V, which doesn't exist anymore. That was like 20 years ago, actually, yes. It yeah. was, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, but, but again, thank, thank you so much for, for coming. I've got some questions for you. Now, we haven't spoken since 2018. And so I just I think it's more like 2000. 2018 was only four years ago. Tw sorry, 2008. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're sorry. Yes, you're right. Um, are you going to be okay if we throw some questions to the floor? Absolutely. Okay, sure. so we will have time for two or three questions uh, if you are if you are thinking of any. Um, but I'm going to ask you a couple first. Um, you, you talked a lot about uh, some very big big theories and, and, and concepts and stuff. Um, and a lot of stuff that Animoca does is, is around games and, and you know, with 3.4 billion gamers globally, the, you know, what, a, what an amazing, clear why you're working in the game industry. Um, but what about the non-gaming focused industries? What, what is Animoca doing in that space more specifically than the big stuff you were talking about? Um, and what advice can you give to people here about, you know, if, if the Web2 crowd are here, how can they, how can they get involved? So first, I mean, it's not just gaming, right? Uh, anyone who's creating content in the Web2 world uh, will benefit greatly from moving to Web3 because as I said earlier, content becomes an asset and you can have capital formation benefits of these assets. I think NFT artists are an ex interesting example of the earliest form of that, but the same will happen for music, film, media, anything like that. The reason we focused on gamers wasn't just because of the industry being obviously fast, faster growing and bigger, but it's also the fact that it's the main way in which most of, our, uh, most of the world actually engages with culture. So it's the highest influencing factor. Right? It used to be maybe radio back in the day, maybe it was television for us, right? but it's gaming culture today. That's how we engage. And the second thing is, is that gamers have already a relationship with virtual goods as one of ownership. You ask your children, for instance, about what they want for Christmas. They want something virtual, likely. You ask whether they own the skin. They say, of course I do, and their friends think they own. Of course, in reality, they don't, but they don't know that difference. Right? So that's one of the reasons we focused on gamers. But you know, one of the areas we're also very bullish on right now, we recently acquired a company called TinyTap. And TinyTap basically does education. And so we think of it very similarly. Educators around the world, teachers, are in fact some of the greatest content creators in the world. They make content all the time. But they too didn't have the benefit of capital formation on the content that they make. And again, Web3 can do that. Imagine a teacher with this platform, TinyTap. They make about 100, 500, maybe $1,000 a year with their content that will help children basically um, you know, learn math differently, for instance, right? When you turn that into an NFT, it can take care of many of the legal frameworks around sort of publishing rights. That means that you can now have capital formation. You as an investor could say, oh, if I get 10% yield on this $1,000 a year yield on teaching content, will I be willing to pay $10,000 for that? Now, you give a teacher $1,000 a year, that's nice added income. You give him $10,000 on the sale of an NFT, that changes their life. And we think that's basically what's happened with NFT artists, it's happening with gaming, it'll happen with every industry 
that creates content. Fantastic. And, and I know that's something you often ad advocate, and there's, there's a few lawyers in the room. He's gone. Where is he? He was there. He's been sitting there all morning. And, and, and um, Ed's here. There's a, there's a few lawyers. You, you talk about digital property rights. Yes. Um, <coughs> how's that going to get managed in Web3? <laughs> so the, one of the big issues about data is that under um, general most common law um, is you don't actually have data. That is, data isn't considered a property right. So data is like the air that we breathe. So the only way that you can contractualize sort of data is through contract law. And that's the issue. That's the reason why when you go to Facebook and you basically just do a click-through agreement and you sign off all your data rights, it's legal. But in the physical world, even if you were to sell yourself, if you were to sell yourself to slavery, that's not legal. You can't do that. You can't sell yourself in that manner because it's against the Constitution and against your rights. But data doesn't exist in that framework. Now, part of the reason it never existed in that framework is because there was no way to do that because data was privately held inside a company. Imagine, however, now that data is publicly held, and the only way you can alter the data is through a mass consensus. Now you can actually begin the formation of truly having property rights. But the property rights can only exist contractually until countries legislate. The UK, for instance, has started an investigation around maybe data should be a property right. For instance, in Europe, we think the solution to the big platforms isn't going to be more GDPR, more data privacy. That's actually been, had a negative effect. Rather, if you make data property right, then all the derivatives of that data becomes you as an end user. You get to decide, should that data be used by the platform? What are the terms of service? Because it is my property. Right? If you own a piece of land and it happens to have oil, you can't just come in and drill on your land. You should have the ability to negotiate those terms. That's basically what, this, what will happen. But you first needed something like blockchain to actually make the idea alive first before you can legislate on it, because governments will typically run behind. Um, right, let's go, to, let's go to the floor. Do we have a first hand up? There you go. Can we get a, a, a microphone, please? Got, I know there's a couple of wonderful branded people with microphones. He had to be the furthest away, didn't he? Thank you, Gina. Jasper. Hey, who I are think, you? Hey, I got to say you look great in that charcoal gray suit. Good to see all that matters back in the real life. <laughs> Anyway, I'm Clarence uh, from Bandwagon Labs, and yes, you, you know, we met earlier, and, and thanks so much. I think, uh, you know, on behalf of many of the Web3 people here, um, your thought process on Web3 is one of the deepest that I've seen, and it's really inspired both me and my company to build in the metaverse. So, um, you know, I also had my wedding in Sandbox. Shout out. Yeah, to ladies and gentlemen, this Sandbox guy just guys got here. married in the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks to the Sandbox Two weeks team. Ago. Yeah, Two we weeks managed ago. to host our first wedding. Uh, it was all over the news. Yeah, and thanks to Smobler at Studios and Loretta over here. So now my question is more of a deeper one. I think uh, one of the issues that, you know, it's plaguing, I guess, Web3 metaverses right now is the idea of um, user base. Right, um, and you know, people comparing it to Web2 metaverses and saying that's a lot less users, and you have the wallet, which is a barrier to entry to start with for a lot of mass market people to start adoption. So I guess my question for you, Yatsu, is like, what do you feel are the tipping points that would kind of move the mass market into embracing decentralized metaverses? Great question. So, and congratulations again on your wedding. So I think the first thing is, in terms of, let's address the complexity part first, because. Axie Infinity, for instance, has demonstrated that a base in the Philippines that can onboard millions of people who are basically never banked, don't have credit cards, but can still use a crypto wallet and earn money playing Axie Infinity, demonstrate that the complexity, actually, of using a blockchain wallet isn't that hard. It's just a matter of whether it's a social norm. It's difficult to open a bank account. In fact, it's harder to open a bank account than opening up a MetaMask. But you're, not used, you're used to that idea. You know that you have to wait sometimes weeks to open one. But when it comes to something on the web, you think of it, oh, I need to be able to do it from a click and just move forward. So that's more of a norms issue than an actual sort of, uh, sort of I think, categorical difficulty. It's not that difficult. The other thing, of course, is that's why gaming is exciting. Because how many of you who play games, how many of you have learned new systems every time you play a new game? And how long does it take you? It doesn't take you one minute. It takes you 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And at the end, suddenly you're a great first person shooter, or you know something about the lore of the game, and you've learned some history. Every person who plays games actually through an engaging form of storytelling has learned a new system. That's why we have new systems like first-person shooters and role-playing games and strategy games. Somehow those mechanisms work. So I think the onboarding mechanism will happen with that too, with the right type of storytelling and right type of approaches in this one. But let's talk about the user, um, sort of the user numbers per se. One of the beautiful things about Web3 is that you don't need 
5 billion users to make money. You don't need to make a game that has 10 million users to be even moderately successful. Because that's the issue. In a rental environment, you can only make literally cents or dollars per click. However, when you have capital formation, that user is now worth its real value. Whether that's $60, $50, $100, who knows? But the point is, you can have a community that has only maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of players, and you can still have a reasonable business. Nobody wants to necessarily build a business to turn that into a unicorn. That's just a fascination of a zero-sum, sort of winner-takes-all type of approach, which is what VCs have been pushing, particularly in the Web2 narrative. But the reality is that most of us would be very happy if we can make a reasonably good business in the environment that we have in, focusing on our thousand true fans who can actually value us. For those of you in the music industry, it doesn't matter that you have a thousand true fans because your stream in Spotify is worth exactly the same to the person who makes 10 million per, per view versus a uh, per stream versus the one that makes 1,000 or 2,000. Imagine a future where physical world was like this. We'd be all eating from McDonald's instead of having gourmet restaurants or Michelin star experiences or you know, basically hacker stores. That, because you can have a sustainable industry with thousands of customers. That's normal. What's abnormal is that in this Web2 world, we somehow think that in order to make money in the space, we must all scale. What does it mean for SMEs? It means SMEs have to die in that model, which is actually ironically not what people want. Everyone's trying to push the growth of SMEs and small businesses, and yet here we are advocating that an SME must have millions of customers. That doesn't make sense. So Web3 brings it back. And as a result, I think Web3 companies always have an unfair advantage. You can't make a game company um, that has the same type of ARPU in Web2. It's a reason the stat I just showed is why all of the VC funding has gone predominantly into Web3 gaming from the gaming space, because it's just a better model. And I think this is the point here, which is the formation and the growth of this will happen slowly. It's already happening pretty fast, but slowly, relatively, and then just absolutely explode. Um, and I think that's happening basically right now, where I think in the next uh, two years, we're going to have hundreds of millions of users join the space, primarily because of gaming. And then you'll have so much economic force, like an open market, that it pushes everyone in um, even more rapidly. But it's already happening. Thank you, Clarence, and congratulations again. Uh, we're going to come over here in a second. Um, talk about the metaverse. This, this is, I mean, I, I know you weren't here earlier, but um, uh, we were talking about how fun it is being in a room, back on stage, back with standing room only. Thank you very much. Um, uh, when is that experience going to be replicated in the metaverse? And yes, Clarence just got married in the metaverse, but. So, you know, it's, I think it's a relative question. Because especially depending on which generation you're in, you would prefer a more physical experience. I'm not saying that you don't have physical experiences, but I think the willingness to augment physical and virtual is much more readily available for maybe younger generations because that's the norm that they grew up in. Right? And when you ask anyone, or even yourself, when you play a game, when you're sort of doing a raid or when you're doing a party in Fortnite or something and you're playing together, the feelings that you have inside those games are the same as you have in the physical world. You feel frustration, you feel anger, you feel happiness and excitement, just the same way as if you would if you were playing something in the physical world. So we're already there from an emotional standpoint anyway. That doesn't mean that we actually won't meet physically. In fact, our view is that just like we've seen with Zoom, Zoom has done a lot of things for us in terms of connecting the world, but it can't replace some of the physical aspects that we so treasure. But what's interesting is that despite the pandemic, when we meet, like in this conference, you meet people you may not have seen physically for years, and yet you can connect in a way like, hey, I know everything about you. There's no secrets. You know, whether it's on Facebook or you hang out on Zoom, you're able to basically catch up really quickly because you're actually already connected in that manner. Whereas in a sort of non-metaversal world, we would have to catch up all of our life for two years because we had no update from each other, and an email doesn't do it. Right? So I think we're already at this point where you know, the augmentation of this one isn't necessarily a VR goggle per se. The augmentation comes from the fact that we are already sort of so interconnected that, you know, the virtual and the physical are blurring into the meanings of our life, not necessarily because we are existing in an interface. The interface is just one way to experience it better, but it's not the way, I would say. So they complement rather than replace, and you're, and you're making me feel really old as well, but that's okay. <laughs> um, We've got Marcus and Neeraj. Mar Marcus, can we have the, the, the microphone, please? In the, the, the German in the Adidas. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so Marcus Lua here, um, fellow YPR. I think we connected before. 
uh, around gaming esports companies here in the region. Um, my question you brought up uh, XT Infinity earlier, um, which obviously did extremely well. Um, you know, built two billion dollar valuation. I think has dropped dramatically recently, and partly is you know because. I guess the model wasn't working as well as we all assumed, and there are some people even call it potentially a Ponzi scheme, where as players stop playing, it, it all the whole ecosystem collapsed. What's your view on this? On a NFT games, the future of it, which we I believe is, is huge potential, but the tokenomics and other areas obviously maybe went wrong there. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So first, I think Axie Infinity's token cap is still about three billion dollars, so it's not doing too badly. But relative to where it was, obviously it's come down. And I think it's an example of what happens when you have an open market. It's very difficult when you have an open market to stop speculators entering the space. So what happens is, and you've seen this in places like China or any kind of national growth as well, where when people come in, you have some exuberance and excitement and it's running ahead in a bull market. So that's kind of one factor. But the innovation on uh, Axie Infinity and sort of blockchain and what people now call play and earn, but play to earn, isn't actually just the fact that it pays you money, right? That's one element, but how does it pay its money? It pays its money because the value that you normally give to advertising companies, that is a way in which you grow the network effect, goes to the players instead. So in 2022, the projection is that $118 billion in app install revenue will be generated for Facebook, Google, Apple, and all these companies. So each one of you who are making games, you're paying Facebook you know, a portion of money. How much of that money that you just paid them actually goes back into the platform that you're enjoying. How much of that goes into the game industry? Probably almost nothing. Yes, they build infrastructure, but it's diminos. Apple isn't investing in games. Google isn't investing in games. They're not making your game experience better. So they're extracting out of a $200 billion industry, almost half of it goes to them. So that's the issue that we're trying to solve with basically Web3 gaming. You don't actually uh, pay people, you know, the advertising platform for customer acquisition you give the end user the assets up front for joining. So the model, for instance, what people do now with what they call free to own, but the reality is of course to make fees on the trading fees, is that you give the assets. And instead of paying you know, Facebook or Apple $15 per install or $10 per install, you're actually paying the end user an NFT that might be worth $5 or $10, who knows? Right? And then what is the value that they're generating? How much of that goes back into the game? Probably not 100%, but very likely better than whatever you give the platforms. So the difference, though, is that the network effect value that you're generating from inside the game isn't as rich as it maybe was before because the value wasn't there. That's because there was not that many users. That doesn't mean the model is broken. It just means the economic size isn't as big as you know, maybe we hoped it would be because what happens in the market is you have forward multiples. That's the whole point about capital formation. I think this is going to be great in five years or 10 years, so I'm willing to pay five or 10 years forward. So why people buy companies. They don't buy companies on the revenues you make this year. You buy a company because you think it can have five or 10 years of projected revenue this much. But music royalties is the same. You're buying music royalties because of what you projected. It's why the Beatles or Michael Jackson uh, sort of um, library has more value, not intrinsically because it makes more revenue than say something that's modern, but because you think it has more staying power. That's the same thing here. Um, as the markets mature, those models will mature as well and won't be as volatile. I view it like nation states, right? When you grow, they have volatility in the markets. Look at China, for instance. And then eventually, when you hit a mature element, then you can more safely project it. But of course, if you can more safely project it, the opportunity profile looks different as well. Um, we're going to go to Neeraj next, please, Gina, just behind him. Uh, talk, you, talk, you mentioned play to earn. I heard a fan fascinating conversation between your team and a huge gaming company where they were talking about this. this this theory of play to earn and all these kids are earning so much money gaming now mm -hmm. that when they get to the point where we went, you know, do you go to college? Do you go work in McDonald's? They're like, what? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm making too much. I'm, I'm not going to college. I'm not, I'm not going to. And then the, 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 the question was, well, who's going to do those jobs? Who's going to? And it's us. It's the old gits that are going to be working well, at McDonald's again. Yeah, but I mean, I think the other way to look at this is that how many of the actual jobs that we have today actually need to be done by humans in the traditional sense? Right? This is part of the national problem we have right now. We're thinking about truck drivers and people who do menial labor and so on, but the reality is that with AI, robotics, and machines, which we all know is already actually here, many of those jobs can already be done. So this is actually the crisis that we face today. Uh, and it's actually what Yuval Harari describes as the useless human, for instance, right? which is the question of actually humans in doing classic kind of labor is a problem because they're not really needed and their purpose isn't there. 
That's why we think the metaverse is the opportunity. We're generally born to be actually creative. We're not born to be laborers in the traditional sense. That was a circumstance of our time. In the industrial age, we needed people to work on the factories. We needed people to work on, you know, basically generate coal. Um, but today, our faculties are more natural to us, which is our creativity, our feelings, our emotions. And I think this is where machines can be augmentations for that, and the metaverse functions in this way. Think about all of us, you know, I think I see a few people old enough to remember a time in this room where they weren't allowed to use a calculator in the classroom, right? I mean, if we were not allowed to use a calculator in the classroom, most of us probably wouldn't be in the jobs that we're in today because we need to actually have mathematical skills that only a few were able to have. That's really what technology brings to us. It unleashes our creative ability through the support of technology, not that technology is actually replacing us entirely. Well, you actually, it actually inspired us. There's a session taking place this afternoon on the future of work. Right. Um, with this strange notion of work to earn, but clearly that's, right. that's a thing of the past. Neeraj. Congratulations um, on getting us all back here uh, together. Uh, hi, Yad, good to see you again. Uh, one of the elements about this entire aspect of fractional ownership and the fact that the power of data should be remain with the consumer as opposed to those handful of platforms that you talked about is the economy as well. And that we saw last year got to about two and a half trillion or thereabouts represented in crypto form, which if you compare to a global GDP of about 85 trillion became about 3% and was interesting and promising. And yet, the volatility of that has kind of, you know, brought and almost dissuaded a movement away. So my question is, we're kind of at a juncture where you have the big tech web 2, and then you've got the liberating web 3. Uh, is there, do you visualize a world whereby either one is not kind of pointing at making them the Darth Vader and the Sith Lord to, to co-opting and working together? So um, first, I think, you know, when, when we started building this space four or five years ago, with the, the conversation frames were much more around crypto isn't real, it's probably a scam, we don't understand it. That conversation doesn't really exist anymore today. I mean, yes, there are people maybe skeptical about its value in some cases, but for the most part, and particularly with the youth, when you tell them, what are you doing for your, you know, when you're investing, what are you thinking of? the first thing many of them think of is crypto. They're not certainly thinking stocks or bonds. So that's kind of a trend that's shifted. Um, and if you think about you know, how many people have now recruited chief metaverse officers and new brand metaverse officers around the world in the biggest and smallest companies in the world, you can definitely see that there's an absolute trend going there. So it's not the same as it was, say, three or four years ago. So I don't think people, anyway, uh, believe that this is a fad or that it's gonna go away. Everyone believes it's there. It's just when is the entry point? You know, what is the right time to build? How do I enter this space? I don't quite, quite understand it. So that's kind of um, sort of one part of this. In terms of Web 2 versus Web 3, I don't know, what's the example? You know, radio versus uh, the internet, right, for instance? Or is it, it's a, it's a system. Why you enter in Web 3 isn't just because it can make you more money. It's because a way in which we can now have democratic access and broad opportunity in a way that was not possible before, meaning we can share in the network effect. The economy that Facebook has built outside of its $120 billion of revenue that it generates per year is actually probably worth trillions of dollars as an economic force. But that in itself isn't fully documented and well captured. With Web3, you can do that. For instance, if I'm building something on Axie Infinity, um, I can utilize the Axies. Simply by owning Axies, I can participate in the growth of Axie. By owning land and Sandbox, I can participate in the growth of the value of Sandbox without actually having to maybe be HSBC that's building on this platform, for instance, right? So you have a network participation effect that is something that you can't do normally in, in, in sort of a traditional uh, Web2 business model. And then comes to the next point, which is, well, what represents that better hope, that better future, right, in terms of where we have a way in which we have digital freedom, digital identity, sovereignty, and therefore those equivalent freedoms? And today, it seems like Web3 is the only way. Nobody's saying, I love Facebook, right, for instance. Unfortunately, sorry for anyone who works for Facebook here. But that is the challenge right now. And that's not to say that Facebook hasn't provided tremendous value as well. But people have an issue with this one. They recognize the problem that we have with basically the data hegemony that we have right now. So Web3 is that solution. And the, the other thing is that anyone who enters Web3 doesn't come out of it. That's the other thing. When you get into the rabbit hole of Web3 and discover, 
despite all of its sort of, you know, like technical issues. For instance, blockchain isn't the fastest database in the world. It will never be faster than a centralized database. But you know what? In a democratic system, in a political democratic system, you don't have fast decisions either, right? If you go to an autocratic system, you get very fast decisions. It's very efficient. But what happens? Just in the same way, they can take away everything that you've done as well. They can they control everything, right? So will you be willing to accept some sacrifices for speed to ensure your property rights, to ensure equity? And that's why we prefer generally to live in a free market and in a democratic framework than say in North Korea, for instance, even though things could be very efficient if you know the right people. And I think that's the reason why people are drawn to Web3. So I think Web2 to me is a thing of the past. People would go to Web3. But of course, as we see everything, this, this business, is, uh, this industry aside, you know, we look at TikTok, we look at gaming. We just need to look at our youth to know where the future is going. And the youth is looking at Web3. What a fantastic way to finish. What a great line. To, and, I mean, literally everything you say is quotable, right? But, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, a huge uh, thank you to, to Yatsu for coming to all the managers.